Voilà. All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to this new edition of the Worldwide Neuro uh, Dev Seminar. I hope that um, you've missed us as much as I've missed you over the past week. Uh, we're on a special schedule today, Monday, uh, instead of Thursday, and it'll be the same next week. Uh, next Monday will be Guillermina Lopez Bendito, and then we'll be back to the Thursday um, schedule. So today's um, guest is uh, Simon Hippenmeyer from um, the IST, the Institute of Science and Technology in uh, Austria, next close to Vienna. So many of you um, have met with or have, have heard of uh, Simon, despite his young, uh, at least young academic and even biological age. Uh, so Sim Simon did his training in Switzerland. He trained uh, with Celia Arbor. Uh, from 95 to 2000 in, uh, in, uh, in, no, sorry, from 2000 to 2004 in, in Basel, and then went for a postdoctoral fellowship in uh, Liquid Laws Lab uh, at Stanford, where he got interested into broadly biotechnologies, but of course, bio-oriented uh, biotechnologies, so more on the understanding the biology side of, of these kind of techniques, and in particular, where he had an instrumental role uh, in developing the madam uh, technique, uh, which I'm sure you will you will hear about uh, during his talk. So um, this madam technique is really closely associated uh, with uh, Simon's name, but again, he'll be showing us some beautiful biological data. So beyond uh, his his interest and his talent in in trying to unravel these developmental cortical processes, he he is a a generous scientist in, in, in the sense that he's really uh, made uh, this uh, array of tools uh, broadly available, instrumental tools for us to try and uh, understand uh, in particular the clonal diversity, the clonal origins of, of the brain and the cerebral cortex um, uh, more specifically. We were chatting a bit uh, before opening the session. Uh, Simo had told me one of his, uh, you know, um, funny anecdotes from his past or interesting aspects of his his personal history was that he wanted to be a street artist and when i asked him uh, what kind of street artist he said the colorful kind i thought he meant he was you know maybe going to be a clown or something like that but no he meant uh, uh, like a tagger a spray artist and in a, in a sense the colorful kind is is not that different with what you're doing now in the brain simo maybe with more uh, well, uh, I guess a limited palette of colors, red uh, and green, and the yellow helps a bit sometimes, but somehow you've kind of uh, fo followed through your interest with, with color. So with that, um, I'll stop here. The, the screen is yours, and um, looking forward to your presentation, Simon. Well, thank you very much, Denis. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, you can hear. Yeah, thank it works. you very much, Denis. It works. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rennie, again, and everyone who joined in here for this uh, Monday seminar. I think this is really an awesome initiative, so to make uh, the science available all around the world in these times. And um, I'm really grateful to be here, and it's, it's, it's really a great honor. Thank you again, again and the whole team um, organizing this series. So I'm going to share my, my screen. Okay, can you see me or the screen? Yep, you're good to go. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, again, welcome uh, everybody. Um, so this is really an experience. I didn't believe it uh, when people told me how this feels if you talk to your computer and, and you see no one, <laughs> but knowing uh, that you're all there. Um, so major team um, in our lab and um, the interest is actually what are the mechanisms um, that control neural stem cell lineage progression in developing uh, cerebral cortex. Now, um, this is, uh, of course, related also to the question how you actually generate the vast amount of cell types in the brain, because neural stem cells in that regard are quite different than most stem cells uh, in the body that uh, just produce one or, or very limited uh, amount of cell types. So in the brain, we have this vast diversity of cell types that need to be generated by uh, individual uh, stem cells. And um, what we also know is that um, the output potential of these stem cells is precisely controlled. And um, therefore also um, how big your brain, 
will be um, is determined by the potential of uh, these neural stem cells in the sense how many uh, types of neurons and other cells they produce. Now, um, what is always amazing when I look at um, the seeable cortex is it's very precise and uh, or orderly um, uh, laminated structure that is actually also um, visible here when you stay in for particular markers. So this is a mouse section where certain types of neurons here, for instance, in the layer four, are stained for a particular um, transcription factor. Now, um, we all know that um, this process of generating the right amount of cell types um, and also uh, the right types of cell types in the cortex is absolutely crucial also for human. And if things go wrong, uh, we do know that um, if there's genetic mutations that affect the process, that this can lead to human neurodevelopmental disorders or diseases such as schizophrenia or autism. In certain cases, it can be actually quite extreme as um, illustrated here um, um, for these cortical malformations where actually mutation or single point mutations even of individual genes um, such as lysencephaly or microcephaly genes uh, cause either a smaller brain or a completely disorganized uh, brain here. Now, um, this is an inspiration for us actually um, to look at uh, what the clinics tells us, um, which type of uh, mutations lead to which disorders, but uh, we are more interested actually at the fundamental level, really from a, from a basic science perspective, uh, what's the molecular and cellular programs, how to generate uh, the cell type diversity and correct brain size. Uh, in, in other words, how you build up these six distinct layers here uh, in the developing cortex. And, and this is all taken from a, a neural stem cell point of view here. And the approach that we have really taken in the last uh, years, actually, since we started the lab here, is um, at the aim to trace what's the output of individual stem cells and uh, therefore uh, really do quantitative lineage tracing and then at the same time also aim for genetic manipulations uh, in order to de decide for the genetic and the molecular mechanisms and do this all at single cell level. And uh, Dernie uh, already mentioned the prime choice that we are currently taking is actually mouse genetics or and, and the method called mosaic analysis with double markers or MADAM. And this was really uh, the driving force for me to choose my postdoc in the lab of Legion Low because um, actually one week after uh, the paper came out in Cell, the first one, 2005 by Hui Song, um, I, I really sent my application because I thought this is so cool and I wanna work on this uh, method. So this is now many years ago and um, here I just summarize what MADAM really can do. So the most critical um, property of MADAM is that it can capture progenitor cell uh, division patterns. And what I mean with this is illustrated here. So you see a single clone here um, where we have uh, lots of green and red cells. And this happens when a so-called MADAM event occurs here in a dividing stem cell. Now, I don't have time to go into technical details, which we can also discuss maybe at the end, but what basically happens in such a MADAM event is that uh, two fluorescent markers are reconstituted. So one is a green fluorescent protein and the other is a tandem uh, dimer tomato. Now, if these cells keep dividing, you actually see a bunch of red cells and a bunch of uh, green cells. Now, if um, one of the cells stops dividing, um, there's an asymmetry uh, in the number of labeled cells. So here's just one red cell and there's a bunch of green cells. And these are so uh, such asymmetric uh, clones, uh, as we call them. Now, um, an added property of uh, the MADAM system is that I already mentioned, you can actually also introduce genetic mutations and you can do this uh, very precisely and only specifically in one of the lineages. So here, for instance, in the green lineage, you can introduce a mutation for a given candidate gene uh, of interest and compare directly in the uh, in situ uh, situation or in vivo, uh, what happens to these mutant cells when you compare them to wild type cells which are labeled uh, in the other color. Now, um, I wanna show you um, later how this looks, but um, so for the last 10 years or so, we really have taken a huge effort to actually generate a whole genome Madam library. And I will come back to this uh, in a second that basically would allow you to study any given candidate gene of interest. But let me show you now uh, how such a clone really looks uh, at higher resolution. So you can see here a bunch of green cells and red cells and all what you see here, I mean, these are neurons, these are astrocytes here, a little bit overexposed. All that you see here is actually the product of a single um, or the output of a single labeled stem cells where, where we labeled or reduced the labeling at embryonic day 11 and then looked at uh, in the adult uh, cortex. 
Now, over the years, we have really analyzed hundreds, if not thousands, of such clones that we used as different time points and analyzed also at uh, various um, uh, ages. And um, we have come up with a first quantitative framework of how neurons and glia cells are being produced in the developing neocortex in mouse. And this is summarized here. It's also published. So the inaugural study was really here in a collaboration with uh, Song Hai Shi and extremely talented uh, graduate student, uh, Kate Gao. Now we have followed up also, uh, and also the latest study was a collaboration with the lab of Oscar Marine. Um, but the basics uh, of that framework is illustrated here. So we have a predictable number of rounds of symmetric amplifying uh, stem cell divisions before these radial glia progenitor cells then start to really produce neurons. And that's a critical point in time. But once this happens, um, we were very uh, puzzled actually to find that you can predict the output of a single stem cell when it reaches that point, and it's always about eight to nine neurons in total uh, here in uh, the developing neocortex. Now also uh, the production of glial cells always happens after neurogenesis. This was uh, well known, but we can predict the rate of gliogenesis, which uh, happens in about one of six such cases uh, after neurogenesis. So we have now a quantitative uh, framework where we can actually predict um, how many cells are being produced. Now, very recently, we actually noticed that um, this is true on a quantitative level. But now, when we look at these clones, especially these clone sizes of eight to nine neurons, and we look more closely how they are arranged in the six distinct layers, we actually found there's a certain level of stochasticity that also uh, seems to play a role in the sense that only about 50% of clones really contain neurons here in all the six uh, layers. But there may be also clones that skip a layer. And uh, we have not yet found a predictable pattern how this happens, but this is ongoing work. And as I mentioned, this was a finding that also independently was made in the lab of uh, Oscar Marine. Now, given we have uh, such a quantitative framework, we are very interested now in what are the molecular and cellular mechanisms that actually drive this lineage progression. In other words, how you switch from symmetric to asymmetric division, how you temporarily actually control uh, the, uh, the, the subsequent production of different neuron types and also glial cells. And for that, um, I already uh, indicated um, that um, we can introduce genetic mutations. For that, we take really candidate gene approaches where we can take a gene X and introduce a mutation specifically in the green cells. We can then compare the phenotype of this green cell to the wild type red cells and thereby infer a, a cell autonomous uh, gene function. Because uh, the neat thing is this is done very sparsely uh, or even clonal, as, as we've seen, and the background is uh, normal. Uh, um, to be precise, it's heterozygous. Uh, this is a technical uh, side effect here, but if the gene is not dosage sensitive, uh, that will work well. Now, um, stem cells uh, rarely act in isolation. In other words, they are embedded in a tissue. And um, so we were thinking there may be also systemic or more global tissue-wide effects that may play a role uh, in, in, in the lineage progression. And in order to try to get a quantitative handle of these uh, non-cell autonomous effects, um, we also uh, established another paradigm with single cell labeling. Namely, here uh, we take the same gene and knock it out in all the cells. So in other words, you see the green cells, they are identical in terms of genotype, but the surrounding here is different. And this is uh, quite important also from a clinical point of view, because these non-cell autonomous effects, which actually um, are the differences in the phenotypes of green cells, since they are identical, uh, may matter uh, in clinical uh, diseases. So um, we have taken this paradigm really um, to go ahead and now probe uh, the function of uh, candidate genes. And we focus initially mainly on genes uh, that are associated in human with microcephaly, bigger brain size, or even somatic mosaicism. Now, I will just illustrate one case because uh, in the later talk, uh, I, I really would like to focus on unpublished data mainly, but uh, we have published a few years ago um, um, uh, the function of a gene called LGL1 or little giant larvae. This is uh, from a Drosophila uh, inspired name. And um, this uh, really showed us that these non-cell autonomous effects can be quite traumatic because here you can see the genetic paradigms that we took. So uh, in one case, we introduced this uh, LGL1 mutation which is actually a protein controlling cellular polarity here just sparsely. 
or in the full uh, in a whole tissue here uh, where then all the cells are muted and this is just a, a snapshot of the data and you can immediately see that in our case where we knock out the gene entirely uh, in the cortex uh, we have this huge uh, subcortical band heterotopia which in human is also often called the double cortex because it's almost like a second cortex here between the hippocampus and uh, the neocortex now, uh, this we never observe um, when we just sparsely knock out a gene. And uh, we have actually figured out that, uh, in fact, LGL seems to control tissue integrity of the radioglia stem cells very early on uh, in development. But this is really at a global scale at the whole tissue level. Now, cell autonomously, however, function of LGL1 seems to control astrocyte production. And this is um, observed here uh, with these patches of green astrocytes, in other words, mutant astrocytes, and to cut a long story short, uh, when you knock out LGL1, you produce about 10 times more astrocytes from a stem cell than normal. And this is uh, published here uh, uh, by Robert Beatty in the lab a few years ago. Now, we want to take one step further because, um, as I said, uh, the genotype of that mutant cell and this mutant cell are actually identical, except that the surrounding is different. So can we get more insights? What are the mechanisms that lead to these dramatic differences um, of, of a gene mutation? And so we have uh, taken a relatively simple-minded approach where we just um, started to isolate those green cells uh, from control. These are white type cells and then the two different mutant cells uh, and then uh, do a simple RNA sequencing at the bulk level. And um, what we observed immediately is actually this. Now, um, despite the fact we have two cells that are identical, with different surrounding, we have very different responses in gene regulation. In other words, um, you have a very different set of genes up and down regulated depending on how your environment looks. And um, so this is on top of the cell autonomous uh, effects that you will have in these uh, mutant cells. So this we have done actually a few years ago, but then the technology uh, get more sophisticated uh, every week as we speak, I guess. Um, and now uh, the thing to do is uh, figured out is really go at the single cell level. So we applied the same paradigm here and now did a 10x uh, single cell only sequencing experiments where we sequence a few thousand uh, of, of these cells. Now the advantage of um, our 10x experiment, I mean this is just the raw data here on this U map that you see, um, we can now really go to the single cell map uh, and map these transcriptomic uh, changes at single cell level, but we can not only do that, but, uh, we can also estimate the relative abundance of these mutant cells or disappearance or over uh, representation at the highly quantitative uh, level. And that will allow us to really determine the cell type specific gene expression changes that happen uh, um, in ten, uh, depending on the uh, surrounding cells here that surround that mutant cell. And then of course, we can also determine the specificity of uh, that uh, loss of function phenotype. And uh, we currently use this uh, as a hypothesis generator to really then probe uh, the mechanisms uh, and go further. So this is very much work in progress uh, um, that Florian Paolo uh, is mainly doing in the lab. Um, but um, at this moment, I would like uh, to really summarize this, this first part um, uh, of the presentation. So the key message here is really that um, we have a predictable framework of stem cell lineage progression. And uh, one of the key messages I really want to make is that um, if you have genes that control this process, and LGL is just one of many, as we know, um, um, this was our first candidate, but intriguingly, it has actually sequential functions. Um, so firstly, it has a tissue-wide function to control the integrity or the niche, the stem cell niche, if you wish, of the radial glial cell uh, progenitor cells. And if you don't have that, then you uh, have a massive deficits uh, on the proliferation pattern here. But then uh, later on, LGL1 is also required actually to control the amount of cortical astrocytes that are being produced uh, from these uh, stem cells. And uh, because we have single cell resolution, we have here also a quantitative uh, handle on that. Now, um, we could show uh, later on uh, by adding uh, um, or by doing epistasis experiments that um, this function uh, of uh, LGL1 in cortical astrocyte is actually dependent on EGF receptor signaling. This is also something uh, that we are uh, following up. But now um, I made the case here for one single gene. As you know, these days um, people look at global transcriptomes and it's important to, to uh, not uh, you know, restrict your analysis to your preferred candidate gene. But in order to do so, you actually would need a madam resource 
which um, covers uh, nearly the entire genome. And this was uh, not the case until uh, very recently, um, because um, we really now went on to expand the MADAM resource for functional analysis of candidate genes. And I really want to highlight here uh, this resource also and advertise it. Uh, we share it already freely. It's not published yet, but uh, if you're interested, um, uh, of course, uh, we put it on the market uh, right away without strings attached. Now, what I'm talking about. So basically, the MADAM only works for genes that are on the same chromosome where these uh, split marker genes are located. Uh, so this is illustrated with this uh, green, red, uh, GTTG. Again, the technical details are not that important. Uh, so the older literature here covers that. But what is important is MADAM only works if you have these uh, cassettes located on the same chromosome. So in other words, the first MADAM uh, that uh, used the, Rosa, the famous ROSA26 locus here uh, actually only allowed you to study this amount of candidate genes on the chromosome 6. And then we put on, uh, we, we rationalized that if we put on MADAM cassettes at the base of the chromosome, and in fact, uh, mouse chromosomes only have one arm, so that makes things easier, not like human two arms. So if you put uh, these cassettes here at the base, Basically, you can study now all the genes that lie distal um, of these chromosomes. So this resource, uh, we just put on BioArchive about a week ago. Um, if you have not seen it, uh, it's very easy to find, and you can read uh, more about it. But um, it, MADAM is, is, is kind of a, a complicated genetic tool, so we really wanted to provide a resource that uh, also people know it works. And um, so this is really the heroic effort of a, a graduate student, or actually recently graduated a student, Jimena Contreras, and, and the technician, Johanna Sonta. Now, um, uh, without going really into the technical aspects, I uh, really want to show that it works. So here we have a snapshot uh, in many organs uh, that we analyzed uh, for this MADAM resource. So here's the brain, so these are Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. Uh, I show this because they are quite aesthetically pleasing. Um, but uh, we actually found out that uh, the MADAM resource should work in all the tissues and organs that we uh, analyzed. We then also went on to really quantify uh, the amount of labeling. So this is at really low res, and this is now uh, the brain uh, for, for your interest. And you can see that the diverse uh, MADAMs have very different recombination rates. We actually don't know what's the underlying uh, cause of that, uh, and uh, it would be probably very interesting to find out. Um, uh, currently, we, we have shown that uh, really all the MADAM reporters work for all the 19 chromosomes. We have access now to about 21,000 mouse genes. Uh, so that means uh, more than 96% of all mouse genes can now uh, be studied with MADAM using clonal analysis or the assay I just showed to the uh, cipher cell autonomous and non-cell autonomous uh, gene function. Now, of course, this is at low resolution. You can also use MADAM to really go at high resolution and uh, really, really look at the fate of uh, single cells. So this is, again, the cerebellum, two Purkinje cells, and here these are granular cells. And you can see these uh, claw-like uh, dendrites here. And then uh, you can really appreciate uh, at this high resolution level, you can, if you have good eyes, see the spines here on the Purkinje cells, but also the single axon here uh, exiting of, of the cell body. And you can use that now uh, really to introduce candidate gene mutation and, and, and study virtually uh, any gene of your interest and then look at the morphology or function of these uh, neurons. Now, this is another example of a hippocampus. Um, if you zoom in, you can also see that this was work uh, in a slice uh, preparation assay. You could probably stick in an electrode in a red cell, in a green cell, record your physiological properties, and then depending on the mutation, you can actually try to uh, analyze the phenotype. Uh, quite precisely. Now back to the cortex um, here. Um, this is a, an image with astrocytes at high, somewhat high resolution and, and some uh, pyramidal cells here in a zero cortex. But with that, um, I really want to um, actually uh, switch gears a bit and, and then go to the uh, second part of, of my talk that uh, really focuses on completely unpublished uh, data. But um, now we are in the process actually to really work out uh, systematically the mechanisms that drive the lineage progression here, um, as I just elaborated from radionuclear progenitor cells, uh, um, how you amplify uh, clonal units, how you produce the clonal units, uh, what's the level of uh, molecular mechanism or stochastic mechanism uh, that are at play here, and then also how you establish actually post stem cell niche and, and produce glia later on. And uh, the prime assay, I, I try to illustrate uh, with the example of LGL1. We have many genes where we now go for that. Um, but basically, we introduce a candidate gene mutation very sparsely. 
uh, to really decipher cell autonomous uh, uh, gene function uh, or actually infer uh, it and then also have a full tissue or, or, or even full animal knockout where all the cells are mutant uh, to decipher the contribution of systemic effects um, as well. Now, um, after uh, this, I, I really want to go uh, to another chapter here and um, actually illustrate uh, a kind of a different application spectrum that the MADAM technology really offers. And um, here, I, I really now want to uh, move from the lineage and actually discuss how lineage uh, may or could translate to cell type diversity. Now, what uh, do we understand uh, under cell type diversity? So I guess if you look at the literature or in Twitter, every five uh, minutes or so, there's a paper uh, showing you single cell uh, transcriptome uh, data, which is actually fantastic because I think there has been never a time where we had so much information to dig in really and uh, really to design our own analysis of, of such huge amounts of data uh, that are publicly uh, available. But what uh, we understand under cell type diversity these days, uh, mainly, I mean, besides other criteria, is actually the transcriptomic fingerprint um, that these cells show. And uh, using computational methods, actually, it's now uh, possible to um, define actually the cell types here based on, on the uh, expression of um, uh, genes uh, in these uh, different groups. So this is a relatively old uh, image taken from uh, Tazic. Uh, Edal, who really uh, had this first paper here, or one of the first papers here in Nature Neuroscience together, or shortly after Amit Sison published uh, his work. Now you can see there's a string of papers, and uh, we still, in my opinion, need more information, but what people do is now they try to increase the number of sequence sets that will actually provide a substrate for more uh, statistical approaches or computational methods to really define cell types on a finer uh, scale here. There's even a brain initiative uh, a project called the Cell Census Consortium. They really aim to generate a more co or a very kind of comprehensive uh, brain cell atlas. Now, um, this is of course uh, great news, although we have to see that uh, this is probably just the beginning because if you think of a mouse cortex, which has probably 20 million cells, um, we are still quite far away uh, uh, to potentially cover all of this. So I guess, uh, we really need uh, such amount of data. Now, um, this is great um, that this is all uh, like ongoing so 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 well at the moment. But uh, the question I really want to ask is, how does actually this genetic or transcriptomic cell type diversity uh, translate into phenotype eventually uh, and function? Or in other words, how relevant is it uh, um, uh, how you classify the cell types based on transcriptome? And for the rest of the talk, I really want to cover um, uh, this question in more detail and ask specifically what is the role of gene dosage as such and more specifically um, what's the function of genomic imprinting um, uh, in, in cortical development. Um, now uh, genomic imprinting is a very intriguing epigenetic uh, phenomenon but um, what is it actually? Um, so genomic imprinting is a process um, of parent of origin specific gene expression. So what does that mean? So usually um, you have a complement of chromosomes from your mother um, and a complement of, of chromosomes from your father. Right? And most of the genes are actually expressed um, from both of these uh, complements uh, of chromosomes. So you have a, a double dose of uh, gene expression usually, which is very useful because if, if you have a mutation in one of the copy, you still uh, may rescue uh, yourself uh, by having the other copy expressed. But um, this is exactly um, the problem with uh, imprinted genes because um, imprinted genes are selectively only expressed if they either come from the mother, so this is a maternally expressed gene here, or if they come from the father, this would be a paternally expressed gene. And the other copy while present, so that DNA sequence is absolutely identical, um, is not expressed. And the, the basic mechanism here, or the most widely applied mechanism is actually DNA methylation in regulatory elements uh, to prevent expression of uh, the cognate uh, copy here. Now this has consequences about uh, on the dose of gene expressed uh, uh, as such. Um, you can see that there is only one copy uh, expressed um, from each the maternally or the paternally expressed genes and of course that's very different um, from um, the regular biologically uh, expressed genes. Now people have studied imprinting for the probably last 40 years or so 
And um, it's actually very intriguing uh, because imprinted genes have a bunch of functions in the brain. And actually there are quite many imprinted genes that are prominently expressed in the brain. However, uh, we really lack a comprehensive understanding from the molecular and cellular uh, point of perspective because most of the uh, imprinted genes that have been studied actually have been found to regulate important behavior, mainly actually uh, mother-infant interactions or communication as such. Um, but there is a whole bunch of other processes uh, uh, that have been studied and been associated uh, to imprint the genes. Now, the in interesting thing is that um, there's about 1% of all genes in the genome uh, that show imprinted expression in the mouse. Um, imprinted genes are also conserved in human. Now, some of these genes seem to display non-canonical imprinting. This is uh, having an expression bias. In other words, it's not 100 and 0, but maybe rather 80 and 20 or 70 and 30% of expression. But the cardinal uh, definition of an imprinted gene is really that any change in gene dosage has to result in a phenotype. In other words, if you ablate the single copy or if you overexpress uh, uh, the, the one copy to two copies, um, that uh, should result in a phenotype. So that's the cardinal definition of an imprinted gene. Now, it has been also found that many um, imprinted genes are actually associated with human disease and uh, prominently lead to neurodevelopmental uh, disorders and disease. One of the famous cases uh, you already have spotted uh, is this UB3A. This is actually the causal gene of Angelman syndrome, which is a, a form of autistic uh, disorder. Now, uh, clearly, um, again, this is a communication uh, problem here that seems to be conserved uh, actually between mouse uh, and human. So, um, fine, um, imprinting is very important for brain function. Um, but um, what is not known really is what the role of uh, imprinting or specifically the role of gene dosage is at single cell level. And um, the question uh, therefore arises, is there a role for imprinted gene expression in establishing functional uh, cell identity? So what I mean with this is uh, actually shown here. So you can imagine you have a couple of imprinted genes, A and B, and uh, depending on either the imprint status or the expression status, you actually can uh, give rise to probably six flavors here of, um, I don't know if you want to call it cell type or cell identity, but um, clearly uh, uh, in this cell, A is expressed and only A, and this, this cell, uh, B is expressed and it's only B. And, and this is actually uh, two different states uh, of two different uh, genes. So you can imagine that probably then having two copies of A expressed um, uh, compared to one copy may make a difference. That's why I colored uh, this cell in a, in a slightly different color. Now, um, in order to really approach these uh, questions, um, we, we set out to actually uh, try to map cell uh, type specificity of imprinting as such, but then also interrogate uh, or actually probe genomic imprinting in single cells um, uh, by modulating specifically uh, gene dosage uh, expression. And um, I mentioned already uh, that uh, uh, Madam can here uh, can help here, and indeed, um, uh, so we used Madam uh, along the way uh, to do uh, this project. But before that, I really want to mention this is the heroic work of my first graduate student Susie Lauko, who actually defended uh, close to two years ago her, her PhD thesis uh, together with a senior scientist Florian Powler uh, in the lab. Now. Um, how did we approach uh, this experimentally? So, so this is a, a quite complicated slide, but um, I, let me guide you uh, through this. So we really employed the MADAM um, system to induce so-called uniparental uh, chromosome disomy. What is this? So um, this chromosome disomy already implies uh, from the name, namely that you have either two copies of a particular chromosome, either from the mother, uh, or from the father. And this is exactly uh, what we can do with Madam. Um, again, I will not cover the technical details. Uh, if you're really interested, this is uh, published here in a cell reports paper and, and hopefully soon in, in a follow-up paper here. But what happens um, when we induce the Madam here in a cell with these imprinted genes, um, we induce this uh, double chromosome uh, scenario for a particular chromosomes. So here in this case, you have two copies uh, from the mother and this has consequences because now maternally expressed genes are suddenly expressed at double dose. However, paternally expressed genes because of the silencing are not expressed, right? And here it's vice versa. 
in a paternal disomy, you actually have a double dose of uh, paternally expressed genes and no expression of maternally expressed genes. Now, um, Donnie mentioned sometimes the yellow color in MADAM is really useful, and in this case, yes, it is, um, because these are our control cells, and they are labeled, but these uh, cells have normal configuration. So if we now uh, look at predicted uh, gene expression dosage, uh, in fact, um, we see here this again, one dose of the imprinted genes and then a double dose of the biologically expressed genes. But here in this paternal uniparental disomy, we lack uh, the expression of the maternal copy, but we have a double dose of the paternal uh, expressed gene and vice versa here. Now, um, we rationalized actually uh, uh, many years ago that we probably can really exploit this imbalanced gene expression at these imprinted genomic loci. And this was really, I must uh, admit, uh, and this is kind of embarrassing because it started long ago, this was really before single cell sequen sequencing, but RNA sequencing was just uh, emerging. So we, we hoped really to use highly quantitative uh, expression analysis uh, and thereby map the imprintome of these imprinted genes. And because with MADAM we can actually achieve cell type specificity, at least uh, of genetically de defined cell types, uh, thereby determine also whether genomic imprinting uh, exhibits cell type specificity in the developing brain. And um, lastly, because we are manipulating the gene dosage in these two uh, different uh, parental disomies, we also actually uh, sought out to see whether that has any functional or phenotypic implication of the imbalance uh, imprinted gene expression. Now, um, when we started the project, we really thought, okay, let's let's focus on the entire cerebral cortex, so the neocortex, hippocampus, and olfactory bulb. We uh, not only isolate projection neurons, but also interneurons, uh, um, genetically defined by uh, NKX 2.1 positiveness, and here by EMX1 um, a positive expression. And we focused on three chromosomes that have prominent clusters of imprinted genes. So chromosome 7, 11, and 12, uh, they all have different amounts of imprinted genes. And this is how it looks basically. So um, we see, um, this is the, the regular MADAM pattern. So you have red, green, and yellow cells. And we used um, um, this MADAM labeling to really isolate by facts the different colors and thereby the different genotypes. So paternal, maternal, diisomy, and control, then do RNA sequencing, and then uh, do differential gene expression uh, analysis. Now, um, if you look again at the gene expression patterns, uh, this allowed us to do uh, actually a few predictions. Namely, by using such an assay and uh, differential gene expression analysis, we should be able to identify all the known imprinted genes. And we can ask uh, whether we find novel imprinted genes and if they actually would be uh, uh, expressed in cell type specific fashion, since we have different cell types that we are analyzing. And um, we can also analyze what's the response to imprinted gene uh, uh, expression. And uh, so this is the first or one of the first data sets uh, we obtained. So we sequenced a few thousand cells from each of the different areas, cortex, hippocampus, olfactory bulb for projection runs and interneurons. There's also the, uh, uh, um, the two, uh, actually three different chromosomes here. So chromosome seven, 11 and 12. And now this shows the expression bias, um, uh, whether you tend to uh, more maternally expression or more uh, paternal uh, expression. Uh, so in the middle would be biallelic expression. Now, um, this is not so spectacular, um, but what, really, uh, for, what we really thought is striking is the fact that if you look at the same chromosome with the same number of imprinted genes, depending on the cell type, you have a very different amount of genes that are deregulated at the global uh, scale. So for instance, cortical projection neurons, uh, they only have six deregulated genes for the uh, chromosome 11 disomy, whereas in hippocampal interneurons, there's about a thousand or even more genes that show uh, deregulation here or expression bias uh, in this cell population. Now, um, so we thought, okay, uh, this is in principle interesting, um, but can we identify novel imprinted genes in the bulk of these deregulated expressed genes um, and would they uh, exhibit cell type specificity since we have so different uh, amounts of deregulated genes if you look in the different cell types. Now, um, we spent about three years and um, many um, uh, intrinsic or intense discussions actually among us, um, but we came to the conclusion the answer is pretty much no to, to both of these uh, questions. And uh, we wondered uh, maybe, well, um, as I said, we, we sequenced a few thousands 
of these uh, cells from all of these cellular classes uh, a few years ago, uh, and they actually may still include a mixed bag of individual cells. And so we thought, okay, um, now single cell sequencing really became uh, possible in the last year, so we wanted to increase the resolution of this imprint home analysis and went on to do single cell uh, transcriptome analysis. And this is uh, quite recent data, uh, so we uh, uh, sequenced about 1100 of um, uh, cells um, that have a chromosome 7 uh, uniparental disomy at different developmental stages. I must say this is a uh, smart thing that we are doing here, so we are really sequencing quite deep. Uh, we have about uh, 2 to 5 million reads here, so this is very different from a 10x experiment, so this is really highly quantitative and allowed us to actually cluster the different cell types. So these are uh, uh, radioglia progenitors that also seem to produce olfactory barred neurons, but then also uh, main neuronal classes here are adult neurons that segregate quite a way here, uh, which uh, is, is, is understandable. We also have a bunch of oligodendrocytes. They also emerge from this EMX positive lineage, as well as astrocytes uh, from progenitor to a mature uh, state. Now, this is an extremely rich uh, data set, and unfortunately, I don't have really time to go into all the details, but uh, we uh, basically validated the system, and um, what we found here is actually two key things that I summarized out here, namely that imprint the gene expression seems to be uniform uh, across cell types at a single cell resolution. And before I go to the second, I think I need to plug in my computer. I'm sorry for that. Okay. I thought it's plugged in. I'm sorry for this. But um, the second finding um, that, that we could derive out of this uh, single cell data set is actually that when we look at uh, deregulated genes, um, uh, it was really striking that astrocytes showed the highest number of deregulated genes if we compare this maternal versus paternal uh, disomy. And uh, perhaps more strikingly, uh, there was also a high number of significantly enriched go terms that were associated with synapse growth and apoptosis. I mean, these are, are, are functions of many imprinted genes, um, which is thereby no surprise, but we were actually surprised that astrocytes uh, really show such a, a dramatic uh, increase in deregulated genes in response to this uh, disomic uh, state. So we were interested um, to really follow up uh, this in more detail. Uh, and so we went back to our mouse samples and actually looked at uh, astrocyte lineage. So we started at uh, P0 here and looked at BLBP positive uh, astrocyte progenitors. And what we could find is really that cells with uh, paternal disomy uh, are more numerous uh, here uh, when we compare to cells with a maternal uh, uniparental disomy. Now, when we look in the mature state or in the uh, three-week-old uh, mouse, what we immediately saw is that the number of cells, or astrocytes in fact, I must say, um, that have this paternal disomy are actually about two times uh, enriched uh, compared to cells with uh, maternal disomy. Uh, and here, as a control, we also quantified projection neurons. They really is, are at the ratio of one to one. So whether they have a paternal disomy or a maternal disomy doesn't really matter. They are uh, present in equal numbers. So um, we have really a cellular phenotype uh, as well here um, that you know was indicated already by the sequencing. But the question now is, uh, how does this imbalanced imprinted gene expression on chromosome 7 really lead to this increased numbers um, of astrocytes. So because we already have increased numbers of progenitors, we thought maybe they are proliferating more, um, but we did the experiment. I, I don't have time to really show the data, but um, we only saw a trend towards uh, higher proliferation, um, but that was not really uh, significant. So that uh, must imply there may be uh, uh, more general mechanisms that are uh, associated with this phenotype. Now, uh, in order to really approach this uh, question, we now increased uh, the resolution again of our uh, analysis, and uh, we crossed in a trans gene that expresses uh, LAC-C under the control of the human GFAP promoter here. Uh, and this is really highly specific in cortical astrocytes here. And so we crossed this together with the madam um, uh, in one mouse, and then isolated again by fact sorting uh, uh, all the cells that express also the LAC-C besides having the madam induced uh, uniparental uh, disomy state uh, associated with uh, uh, red and green uh, fluorescent color. 
and then um, uh, subjected the um, D cells uh, to RNA seq and uh, differential gene expression analysis. So we did all the controls. So actually, it is really um, a highly uh, enriched here for for astrocytes, and um, we can see at P zero and P forty, uh, we actually capture um, uh, the uh, the bias or, or you know the, the paternally and the maternally expressed imprint the genes here uh, present in these astrocytes. And now, if we look at the differentially expressed genes, that's actually interesting. If you look, uh, there's a high number. There's a few hundred of deregulated genes, specifically in the cells that show a paternal diastomid. So these are the cells really that are uh, enriched here uh, by factor two. Um, but then um, we ask, okay, what do we do with such a data set? So, so it's, a hun it's hundreds of genes. Um, how can we actually nail this down and, and probably go to, to kind of an interpretation of a mechanism or even uh, generate a hypothesis, which genes could be responsible for that uh, phenotype? So in order to do this, uh, again, Florian Palmer in the lab um, carried out a network uh, analysis of these deregulated genes and associated them with uh, go terms. So this is shown here. So basically, um, we have uh, noticed actually uh, uh, quite prominently that there is many uh, genes, uh, actually there's five imprinted genes here, um, that are associated specifically with deregulated gene networks that seem to be involved in apoptosis. So these are the black ones here. And there's a very prominent uh, caspase A and SARM1 that are well known uh, actually to induce apoptosis. And or uh, uh, then we also uh, noticed that there's cell cycle or, or cell growth. Uh, these are labeled in green. And we see that uh, there's prominent hubs of such genes uh, present. Now, um, of course, there's other genes as well, um, but we thought that's actually uh, maybe something uh, that we could actually test. So, so um, whether apoptosis or cell growth uh, would be involved because we had higher numbers of one of the cell types. Now, um, in order to test this, uh, we actually carried out uh, candidate gene approaches again. And one of the prime growth promoters uh, or imprinted genes on chromosome 7 is actually IGF2. And this is very very well known to really control uh, growth uh, of the entire mouse, in fact, and, and, and certain tissues um, as an imprinted gene. So we, we saw that, okay, why not test uh, whether IGF2 is involved since we have more cells um, uh, present there uh, of one of the configurations. So in our control, let me uh, uh, briefly guide you through this uh, experiment. In our control, we have actually IGF2 uh, because it's imprinted, there's a double dose uh, in our uniparental diastomy. Um, that, uh, from the father, and it's not expressed in a maternal uniparental uh, diastomy. Now, um, if you want to probe uh, the function of IGF2, uh, we actually deleted it specifically from the green cells, which have these parental uh, diastomy from the father, so we ablate IGF2 expression, but we would also predict there should be no IGF2 expression at all because uh, of imprinting in the maternal uh, diastomy. Yet, if you look at the ratio of paternal to maternal astrocytes here, in a paternal deletion, um, we still see that they are overrepresented in comparison to the maternal uh, diastomic cells. And the same happens for the maternal deletion. Actually, here we delete something that seemingly is not expressed, um, whereas uh, IGF2 is still uh, in full dose here. Um, so maybe no surprise, uh, also there, the ratio is increased. But then finally, we knocked out IGF2 from the entire animal, and these animals are actually uh, smaller, so, so they're dwarfs because of a prominent function of IGF2 in uh, organism uh, growth as well. But also in this case, we still saw an over-representation of astrocytes that have a paternal diastomy when we compare to cells with maternal diastomy. So uh, that means IGF2 is probably uh, not involved very prominently here in the growth advantage, if you wish, uh, of these cells that have uh, uh, chromosome 7 uh, diastomy, um, unicorn chromosome diastomy. So in our uh, gene network analysis, we also have noticed uh, terms associated with apoptosis. And so we really uh, thought, okay, why not test that then? Yeah. So um, we actually got uh, mutant allele for bats, uh, actually it's a flux allele, and uh, we crossed this in uh, to our experiment. So again, uh, let me guide uh, you through these uh, genotypes. So actually BAX is not ex uh, imprinted, um, so it's biologically expressed. Um, that's important to know. It uh, actually induces apoptosis, um, but it's also located on chromosome 7. So this has the advantage we can specifically 
uh, knock out Bax uh, in a mosaic fashion, either in the sense that I have a paternal disomy or maternal disomy. And this is what we're doing. So he, this is again the control scenario. We have double dose of Bax in both of the cells. Um, now, when we do a paternal deletion, uh, specifically the green cells uh, lack Bax, but uh, the maternal uh, uh, disomic cells, they still express it. And vice versa. If we uh, delete it from the maternal disomic cells, uh, these cells are now homozygous mutant, whereas uh, the, gre uh, the paternal disomic cells, they still express uh, the backs. And now that's where it gets interesting. So if you do a paternal deletion, we see uh, no difference. So basically, we have still an overrepresentation of astrocytes with uh, paternal disomy compared to maternal disomy. But now when we ablate backs from the cells that have a maternal disomy specifically and leave the paternal ones intact, we actually uh, equalize now the ratio of cells that have a paternal uh, disomy uh, in comparison with a maternal disomy. So that indicates if you block apoptosis in uh, these cells, in the cells that uh, seem to have a disadvantage, you actually equalize it. And so they are both equal again. Now we also knocked out uh, backs uh, from the or, or the cortex, so it's a conditional knockout. And also here, in principle, these cells now should have the same um, survival uh, rate and thereby not be different. And indeed, that's the case. So again, we have a ratio of one to one uh, of cells with, or astrocytes, I must say, of cells that have a paternal disomy compared to maternal uh, disomy. Okay, so uh, let me summarize uh, maybe uh, these findings here. So um, I've told you that um, imprinted genes are prevalent in, in, in developing forebrain, um, but that imprinting itself seems not to be majorly cell type specific. In other words, as, uh, an imprinted gene, which is a paternally expressed one, is also paternally expressed in interneurons or projections or astrocytes. In fact, in all the cortical uh, cell types, it's the same. And the same is uh, true for uh, maternally expressed genes. What I've not shown you today uh, is uh, we also measured the absolute expression levels. And it seems that despite um, they all have the same imprints here uh, in the same uh, gene. They are actually very different expression levels. In other words, an interneuron can have a very low expression level of the same imprinted gene when compared to projection neurons and vice versa. And this is probably the underlying uh, cause of the phenotype we see when we induce uh, this uniparental chromosome disomy. In other words, when we homozygote either the, the chromosome from the father or from the mother, that we amplify these differences in gene expression in a highly cell type specific manner. And uh, this would then lead actually to also these very cell type specific phenotypes. You may remember that we counted projection neurons and regardless of the uh, imprinting status or the disomy status, they actually were present in equal numbers. But we have seen very specifically that astrocytes with a paternal uh, unipater, uh, per, uh, with a disomy with two copies from the father of chromosome seven actually are increased in number, seem to have a survival advantage over cells with a maternal disomy uh, uh, that are astrocytes. And uh, we've shown that when we ablate backs, actually we, we seem to rescue the number of these cells that seem to be at a uh, disadvantage. Now, um, maybe in the last uh, a few minutes uh, or so, uh, let me summarize uh, what I've told you uh, today. Um, so basically, um, I've, I've really started off with, with our interest uh, that, that uh, lies in, in the mechanism of neural stem cell lineage progression in the cerebral cortex. And um, I've shown you that uh, we've established over the years now with, with also collaborations and, and many people involved, a quantitative framework here that can predict how individual radioglia cells progress uh, through the lineage here to produce all the different uh, neuron types in the cerebral cortex and also glia cells. Now, um, with the use of MADAM, we have started to actually uh, analyze uh, gene functions involved in that process. And um, at this moment, we are bound to reverse genetics approaches. Which, in other words, means uh, we're choosing candidate genes that we think may have a prominent role here. And the first gene was uh, LGL1. But um, this is actually uh, just one of probably very many uh, genes that seem to control this process. So I wouldn't make uh, too much of a, of a point here, but what is important is that the same gene actually can have sequential functions and on top of it, it can have very cell autonomous functions, but also functions at the tissue or the whole system wide level. And this is important for LGL1 because in the initial 
stages of neurogenesis, it's actually important to maintain the integrity of the radial glial cell progenitors. And only later on, uh, the cell autonomous function is really important for astrocyte production. And this is in combination or independence of EGF receptor signaling. Now, I've also just now showed you that genomic imprinting seems to be uh, very specifically involved here at the level of astrocyte production, although it's more subtle, uh, if you wish, than LGL1. Here we have 10 times more astrocytes if you lose that genes. Here we only have about two times more, but it's highly significant. Now, I didn't have time, but we also uh, recently uh, studied other genes uh, involved in lineage progression, one of which is uh, P57-KIP2, as is a protein encoded by the CTK1C locus. And also here, we actually could show um, that um, there's a systemic global tissue-wide function, but also a very specific cell autonomous function of that gene in actually controlling the survival of newly born uh, neurons and progenitors. And um, recently, and this was, a, in fact, a very wonderful collaboration with Denis and Chabodon and Stan, um, where we actually probed uh, the role of PRC2 uh, complex, or more specifically, the function of EED here in lineage progression. And um, if you're interested, I mean, this is, is, this is really just half of the story. So the other half, Nicole, in the, in the lab is following up. So also here, we seem to find very different functions um, uh, at the cell autonomous level versus the whole tissue wide level, and we are uh, further working on that. But um, it, in our opinion, uh, shouldn't only be that we now go and probe uh, the, the function of candidate genes, although we can do this now with the matter by genome library. So in principle, we can choose any candidate gene and probe the function of it. And of course, we have many projects doing this. But now looking ahead, maybe in a perspective, what I think is really important is um, we should really uh, get to a level where we can establish a mechanistic or you know, a holistic model of neural stem cell lineage progression. And more importantly, also uh, how evolution may have shaped actually this, um, uh, the mechanisms here. Um, so we are uh, very eager to actually look at lineage progression in other species and also uh, in human neural stem cells uh, um, along the way. Now, one important uh, aspect of um, uh, lineage uh, could be that it plays a role in neural circuit assembly. And this is really at my heart. Uh, uh, when I was trained as a neuroscientist, uh, it was really uh, the mechanisms that drive new specificity in the circuit formation that uh, ca caught my attention. And this is something that uh, some people like Song Hai Shi and others have already started uh, to look at. And there seems to be uh, some role uh, associated in uh, generating specificity in neural circuit assembly. However, the, the mechanisms and the precise function is, is still unclear. Now, on my last slide, I, I would uh, really open up and summarize um, uh, the application, especially the single cell applications of the MADAM technology. So MADAM can really be used for the study of single cell morphology, as, as you probably have seen, and physiolog physiology at high resolution. This can be done uh, in development, but also in the adults or, or in the aged mice. Uh, MADAM uh, can provide a, a great tool for clonal analysis because it really uh, captures uh, pre or provides precise information of cell number, origin, and time of generation. And because of the dual color, we actually can infer uh, the, mech or the way of uh, uh, progenitor cell division um, and, and the patterns thereof. Now, we can introduce candidate genes or mutations thereof uh, for functional genetic analysis, so uh, to really decipher cell autonomy of gene function versus non-cell autonomous effects. And this seems to be really prevalent for many genes uh, that we analyze. So, so probably in full knockouts, there's uh, another level of uh, um, mechanisms that contribute to the phenotypes uh, of, of these mutants. Um, we also can do single cell genomics. Um, these works are mainly submitted or, or in preparation, but I, I think I, or I hope I have convinced you that we can do single cell uh, sequencing at the bulk level, uh, true single cell and the 10x uh, level. I showed you that we uh, really now also study genomic imprinting and allelic expression by using these, uh, this trick of uh, creating uniparental chromosome dyson at single cell level. We can also trace uh, disease conditions. And uh, so, so there's a bunch of neurodevelopmental diseases that we, of course, uh, can analyze but also neuronal degeneration and most importantly, glioma and cancer. So in fact, uh, uh, Hui Song and, and his collaborators have used it very successfully uh, to trace this uh, stem cell of origin or the cell of origin uh, in, in glioma. And uh, there's a lot of work and interest in, in that. Uh, MADAM can be used outside the brain. I'm not sure how many people are interested in this audience in that, but uh, it really only depends 
on uh, the CRE uh, driver uh, that you're using. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, we are interested to really extend the applications to other species uh, and then also maybe to human uh, stem cells. So with this, uh, I really want to also thank all the, the people involved. Um, so I've covered part of the work of Robert Beatty, uh, a postdoc in the lab. And actually, I want to mention that um, he is um, uh, on the job market right now. Uh, so if you're interested in somebody who knows all the tricks uh, with Adam and on top, he's a great scientist, Robert is a really good person. Um, then uh, Nikki, uh, uh, she studied interesting functions in the C complex. But then I, will, I also really want to uh, mention Susie uh, and especially Florian. So, the, so they really uh, did all the imprinting uh, work in the lab. Uh, and Himena, um, together with Hannah, uh, they really were uh, establishing this whole uh, library. I have uh, other people in the lab working on other projects that I didn't have time to, to talk about. But I also want to uh, thank facility support and our funding and um, the major collaborators in the past, like Song Haishi, also featuring the state of food for collaborations, and Simons in Cambridge, Oscar Morin, and uh, many already. And locally in Vienna, Thomas Rilke, I really want to mention, so, so with him we produced all the knock and mice in collaboration at the Vetmet Uni, and the uh, single cell sequencing initially uh, was assisted by the law of Christoph Bock at the Sun in Vienna. And yeah, with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, if there are questions, I'm Thank you for this presentation. I have this new feature for you that I'm testing right now. I don't know if the public is hearing it, but there's a crowd applauding in addition to what's happening on screen. So, thanks for that. Um, let me close the thingy there. Voila. Um, we have, so your timing was perfect, and thanks for sharing and published data. Thanks for driving us through uh, uh, all these, these array of, 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 of findings, not only technical, but I think also uh, showing some interesting ways in, into how we can address how the cortex is built. So we have about um, 10, 12 questions, maybe more will come. <clears throat> I'll take them in the order that they were voted uh, for by the public. Um, are these imprinting gene expression studies done in male and females? Is it possible um, that maybe the results might vary by the sex? It would be interesting to know this. Yeah. So basically, sex-related differences in, in your findings. Right. So um, we have uh, studied in both, that's true, in males and females, um, but we have not uh, observed sex-specific differences, although um, there are um, influences um, on the X chromosome, which may translate to, to really sex-specific uh, differences. The imprinted genes we studied are located on the autosomes, um, so, so they what matters is not the sex, but it's, it's the parent where it comes from, whether it comes from the father or the mother, so in the animals, um, uh, in the F1, basically, the imprint status is the same, regardless if it's a male or a female. Um, what is known is that there may be uh, a sex-specific um, behavioral phenotypes depending on the imprint gene uh, you're knocking out, but we have not yet gone at that level of resolution. So it would be interesting. Okay. How do you distinguish imprinted gene from downstream targets, or those that are on the same chromosome? Ah, yeah. Well, um, so, so of course, we spend a lot of time uh, analyzing that. Um, so we have done a second set of experiments, uh, independent of Madam, um, where we really actually look at allelic expression. Um, so it, what we do with Madam is actually indirect, you're right. Uh, so we look at the end product uh, or the, the global transcript home. Uh, but the other experiment where we cross two distinct mouse threads together, Castaneus and Black 6, in fact, so that's how all the people study imprinting. They have uh, SNPs or uh, you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms that are different for the strains, and therefore we can precisely map whether a gene is imprinted. And uh, if you combine this uh, with uh, RNA sequencing uh, that we have then done with the, with the imprinted isomies, you can abs subtract uh, the true imprinted or allelically differentially expressed genes from 
uh, the rest. This is quite uh, laborsome. Um, I didn't have time to, to really show it, but it's in our manuscript, which, which uh, may come out hopefully soon. Uh, it's all included. Okay. Thank you. How do you distinguish imprinted gene for, oh, sorry, that, that's the same one. I, I could have tried till the end and see if you give the same answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the mechanisms underlying imprinted are mostly methylation related, is that correct? Uh, what is known about cell type specific imprinting? Yes, that, so that is actually, when I started my lab, um, this was exactly the question I really wanted to address. Now, after eight years, and doing allelic expression studies, doing cell type specific uniprinted um, disomy analysis with madam, uh, even at the senior cell level, we haven't found really evidence for cell type specificity. Um, and of course, it's a bummer. We have a hypothesis that uh, adding a level of complexity in gene expression that could actually translate to, to cell type diversity, that was the initial hypothesis we had, and, and we really worked uh, all these years. But, um, I'm not sure um, whether it, it should be like that, but we haven't found really um, that imprinting is cell type specific, at least in the cell types we looked at, which maybe is half a dozen. Did you look outside of the brain, for example? Um, yes. So, so in the initial study, 2013, in the cell reports, where we have looked at the liver, and there we have also a quite specific uh, overabundance of cells with a paternal disomy. Um, and interestingly, if uh, we ablate IGF-2 there, uh, it is IGF-2 dependent. Um, yeah, so, so basically the mechanisms in the brain, the downstream mechanisms likely, they are cell type specific, but the imprint itself um, mm -hmm. is probably, at least within a tissue, it's homogeneous. Uh, there have been studies where they found differences in different tissues, uh, especially, I mean, Catherine Dulac and others, uh, they, they have looked at this more comprehensively in different brain regions. Okay. Do you think the overrepresentation of both radial glia, BLBP positive, and astrocytes in paternal disomy has something to do with the fact that radial glia finally get transformed into astrocytes? Yes, yeah, so we tried to dissect this. In fact, the reviewers also asked about that. Um, so we have done a proliferation analysis uh, to try to see whether we can correlate any difference in the proliferation pattern of these um, BLBP positive progenitors and the final number uh, of astrocytes, but we were not uh, really successful. So, so basically there was a slight trend that paternal disomic cells would proliferate slightly more, but it was not really significant. So what we really think then it could be is that the apoptosis um, may play a major role, but after the astrocytes have been produced and to some extent maybe the progenitors, but probably not too much. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, how can you make the difference between the effect of single gene mutation and uniparental, uniparental disomy? Do you re recommend to study single gene mutations on each chromosome, the paternal and the maternal separately and compare phenotypes? Yes, so um, actually that's a very good question. Um, so because now we're using madam for uniparental disomy and we're using madam for uh, functional genetic analysis, one question was always whether there may be a connection in the phenotypes between the two. Um, madam allows you to actually reverse the parents and thereby you can control. If you have a gene which is not imprinted, like LGL1 for instance, it has a very prominent phenotype. If you switch the colors by switching the parents, this is now really a technical detail, um, you can control for that. If the phenotype persists, regardless of the color, you know that the uh, imprinted or the deregulation of imprinted genes of that chromosome uh, don't really matter. But then on the other hand, you can ask yourself, how can we then study imprinted genes? Um, so this is possible with one limitation uh, because uh, usually one copy is not expressed. So when you knock out an imprinted gene, it mostly mimics a full knockout, but the advantage with madam you will have is a single cell resolution. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we published one study, I didn't really have uh, too much time to go into detail uh, by Susie earlier this year, where we studied CDKN1C. And there we actually could find that the locus itself has a very a specific function at the single cell resolution or at the single cell level, cell autonomously. But then there's a, a layer of systemic um, effect if you knock out that gene. So there may, there's also a lot of non-cell autonomous uh, effects 
uh, at play. But this is very important. Now, for the Madam Library, we have done all the tests. So for the brain, at least, we quantified um, red and green cells. And um, there is no imprinting phenotype in cortical neurons. But there are three chromosomes where we have an imprinting phenotype in the liver. As I mentioned, chromosome 7. There's also chromosome 11 and 17, these three. But knowing and having the quantitative measure actually will allow the dissection of imprinting phenotypes and Okay. A few more questions, Simon. So if you can uh, answer in a focused way, if it's possible, it's great. Amazing talk. Could you give more details on the availability of madam in other species? Yes, so far the answer is um, we, don't, we, we don't have it. Um, so we ourselves in our lab, we are interested in uh, introducing it to human embryonic stem cells and then go all the way making organoids and study the progression in organoids. Mm -hmm. um, I know other people are interested in zebrafish, mainly uh, for imaging reasons, because it's very transparent. So I send constructs to, to people around. Um, uh, there are people that are inter or were interested to, to make also transgenic ferrets, and uh, we ourselves have plans to make transgenic rats. But all of this didn't really happen yet. So with the human stem cells, we have... Um, okay, thank you. In the LG1 story, can you tease apart uh, cell autonomous, non-cell autonomous versus tempo effects of LG1 ablation? The timing of LG1 ablation appears different between MADAM and conditional EMX1 CRE knockouts. Yes, so that's, that's exactly a question we, we have in mind for the single cell uh, sequencing with the 10X. We, we are not yet there. The, the timing of ablation, yes, it's true. Um, if you use EMX conciliatively, um, it's early, uh, but it's actually at the same time. So, so, I mean, whether it's sparse or whether it's full knockout, it should mm -hmm. be at the same time. Um, this is exactly the burning question we have in mind, to really uh, separate yeah, this. You mentioned it, yeah, yeah. Okay. How do you control for the maternal downregulated genes in the PAT UPD condition, in the paternal UPD condition? Um, yes, so, so this is an interesting question. So, because... Um, I showed you the case of imprinting where it's 100 to 0, assuming that the non-expressed um, copy is really not there, but that's not entirely true. So, so imprinting is, is, there are genes there are really basically 100 to 0, but with our RNA sequencing experiments, we are so quantitative, we always see some transcripts, um, but what we don't know is whether it's technical, when you do the signal cell suspension that is floating around, and, and then you also sequence this or whether there is a base level of expression. And for some imprinted genes, actually, it seems to be the case. So they are called um, non-canonical uh, imprinted genes, where you have, let's say, a ratio of 20, 80%. And that's known. So there is a certain level of, of expression. How it's regulated, um, absolutely. OK, three to go, Simon. Some imprinted genes have paralogs that are non-imprinted, e.g., for example, IGF2, IGF1. Did you look at the responses on the paralog genes? Meaning, could they participate in a compensate, cons compensation mechanism? Yes, we haven't done this. This will be very interesting because, in fact, IGF-1 receptor that also binds IGF-2 and actually stimulates growth is also located on chromosome 7. It's not imprinted, however, and this will be interesting experiments to do. Uh, the same is true for IGF-2 receptor, which is chromosome 17 um, and actually inhibits growth. Um, so these are very interesting questions we haven't yet started to look at, but um, there seems to be cross interaction of the IGFs with the IGF receptors. Some input and some input. Okay, one more. Maybe I missed this, but if you would do the madam analysis of imprinted genes using a different chromosome than the seven, would you expect similar results? Could it be that seven is for some reason more susceptible in astrocytes? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So. We are uh, in process to look at this, so we have all the 19 madams now, um, and we haven't so far uh, really significantly found major imprinted uh, phenotypes for other chromosomes. But I must say, um, the variability in madam uh, is there. So, so I mean, for, for a phenotype which is different in a factor two, um, we really needed to analyze dozens of mice and, and counted ten thousands of cells to, to really uh, assure um, we have significance here. So this is a huge amount of effort, but uh, prominently you really see it in the liver. There it's black at day and night. You look at one slide, you see the phenotype immediately. For all the phenotypes we don't see immediately, that requires, of course, 
much more careful uh, analysis. And, and I bet there's many more phenotypes associated with film printing, especially at the physiological level, which we haven't even started to look at. So, so the answer is, um, we don't know, but uh, it's not, um, not impossible, except that um, it seems that not all the chromosomes have really in the genes. So the ones that don't have, um, they probably not. Okay. Okay, Simon, we're uh, reaching the end of the list, so I'd like to end by thanking you again. Uh, thanking uh, Thank you all of you out there for, for being there and um, waiting to see you or interact with you again uh, next Monday, 5 p.m. in Geneva, uh, Guillermina Lopez Bendito. Until then, have a good week and um, take care. Thanks again, Simon. Right. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks.